Greetings ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Advanced Map Making Tutorials. I am Sly Slime, this is episode 5. We are now at the point where we have a sort of working lobby which contains the players and where players can split up into two teams, red and blue. And if you want more, then you can add more teams easily with this framework. Before we begin, I just want to do a quick shout out to Mitrovite, who left a comment on the previous episode where we talked about using a bunch of commands to make sure the item frame doesn't spam us with sounds. And Mitrovite said, can't you just make the item frame silent with a silent NBT tag? And yes, of course you can. And that's a much better solution than the one I had in the previous video. I'm not going to change it in here because I can't be bothered moving all of these blocks around though. But thank you for that comment. As you can see here, I've done a few things off camera since the last episode. I've labeled some of the blocks because we're getting quite a lot of blocks now. So this block right here is the player setup. That's where we start doing all the work with setting people into adventure mode, clearing people's inventories, to giving them effects so that they stay well fed and so on. Then we have the lobby item frame commands that we put in last time, the team effect clouds, and the uh, commands to join the red and blue teams. And I've also turned it around. I said I would have a 16 long string of blocks here. So we're turning here. I missed it. So I had one block extra last time. This time we are going to start getting into map controls. So if we do game mode zero here, head on over to our little lobby area. Now that we can join a blue or red team here, we're probably going to want some other controls. Not least of all, we're going to want a control to start the game. We're going to start with a different control though, because we don't really have a game to start yet. So let's maybe put up an actual wall here instead of these barrier blocks on this one side. And here we will have our controls. The controls are going to use clickable signs. And clickable signs inevitably means getting into the raw JSON format and all of its nice little nuances and stuff. We will start by just making a clickable sign that lets us cycle through the round length. So it'll say something like round length and then one minute. Now Players are going to be able to click this and it will cycle through. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, and then maybe back to one. That's the objective. Now, what are the problems involved with this? Well, first of all, we have to set up a sign so that it can be clicked. And we can't really do that in any other way than executing a command that changes out the data for this sign. There are two things we could do. We could do a click event on this sign, which sets a score for something that costs the system that we have over in our spawn chunks to update. Or the alternative is to use what's called a trigger. Now, what is a trigger? A trigger is a certain type of scoreboard that lets players execute commands themselves. Why is that useful over just setting a score directly from the sign? Well, it is useful because we can then control who gets to control the map. For instance, if you've played Entrapment on the realms, you've played a version of the map where everybody can control the map. Everybody can go in and click all the signs and do all the things. If you're playing it on a separate server though, you're playing a version of the map where you have to be an operator to be able to control the map. So if you're an operator, you get a chat command sent to you and that lets you control the map. I'm not going to take it this far, but I'm going to show you how you separate who gets to control the map and who doesn't. First of all, though, we're going to add that trigger. And the trigger is a certain type of scoreboard, of scoreboard objective. So we're going to do scoreboard objectives add, and we'll call the scoreboard action. And it is a trigger scoreboard, and it is a map control action. So now we have a scoreboard called action. Then that lets me use the trigger command. So I could then use trigger action set one, for instance. But it gives me this weird error, says invalid trigger name action. And that is because I need permission to do so. so scoreboard players enable slice time action. So now I have enabled trigger action for slice time. We can try to do trigger set action one again. And now it says trigger action changed with set one. And scoreboard to set display sidebar action will show us that I now have the number one. So what does this have to do with signs? 
and the controls. Well, if I put in a trigger command in this sign rather than a scoreboard player set command, that will actually execute on the player who clicks the sign, which means that we now know who clicked the sign. So that's useful either because you want to have the control do something personal for the player so you could set your own status. For instance, you can use it to join teams if you don't like this system. Or it's useful because we want to do some form of permission checking. Am I allowed to change the round length or not? Now I am, because I now gave myself permission to use the action scoreboard. This is what we're going to be using here. So let's go back to our command box and we're going to set this up from here. So let's add a command block here and let's set a sign here immediately saying what it is. So this is action one cycle round length. This is a pretty good way of commenting what it is that you're doing. So our round length is going to have to be stored somewhere. So I'm going to simply do a scoreboard for that. Scoreboard objectives add round length dummy and round length. Now that creates one single scoreboard that is only meant to store a single value. Why is that good? Well, you could have one scoreboard and that's like a setting scoreboard and they have a lot of different values in them. I like having a separate one because that means I can use this game armor stand as a storage for each of them. And why is that good? Well, if you have an armor stand as opposed to just a value directly in a scoreboard, then you can execute on it, which will be very useful in just a little bit here. So we want to do execute on the player who has a score of action that is at least one and the score of action that is at most one. So exactly one. And we're actually, we want to do this on one player. And that player is going to do scoreboard players add at E type equals armors. Game equals game round length one. So if a player does an action and that action is one, then we're going to add one to the round length. Now, this is going to start running immediately and it's going to run once every tick. So if we do scoreboard objective sets place sidebar round length, we'll see that it's ticking on here. <laughs> it's probably not what we want. Whoops. It goes here. So we said that we wanted to toggle between one and five, which means that we're going to have to do something about this number becoming more than five. There are two ways to do this. You could essentially do an execute or you could do a player operation with a modulo command. I find the execute to just be simpler. So we're again going to do, let's just copy that. We're going to do something very similar. We're going to do the same execute and we're going to do scoreboard players set and the same thing, except if they have a score in the round length scoreboard that is at least six. Then we're going to set the round length back to one. So now you can see that it's cycling between one and five, which is exactly what we wanted, but we didn't want it to happen all the time. So uh, I'm going to need a few commands here in between, and I'm just going to leave them blank for now. And those have to do with updating the signs and that kind of stuff. But first of all, we want this to happen only when we trigger it. So let's go in here and do some very simple things. What we're going to do is reset the score of anybody who has the action score. So scoreboard players set at P score action main equals one score action equals one action zero. So this is exactly the same selector that we've used before and now we're setting it to zero. So you'll see that the round length stops cycling. Now we have two problems left. One is the fact that, well, the sign way over there in the spawn doesn't update and you can't click it. You can only do this manual command slash trigger action set one. The second problem is that if I do that now, I'll get this trigger action is not enabled. Well, I enabled it. Well, yeah, but that turns out to only account for one use. So 
The simplest way is to just add another command here that's going to enable it for us. So we can do scoreboard players enable at a action. Now what this does is let everybody control the map. And that's the way we're going to leave it for now. If anybody's interested, we can do an episode later in the series that shows you how to do the entrapment thing where only operators on the server can control a map. But not for now. So if I do trigger action set one now, you'll see that it cycles up the round length by one and then it cycles back to one. So now we have the question here of how do we get this onto the sign? Well, we have these two command blocks that we left empty before. The first one we're going to do an operation because it turns out that reading scores onto a sign is complex enough and has a few bugs in it or weird things. The Minecraft wiki actually says that the score selector is supposed to be able to handle a selector, but it doesn't in my experience. So we're going to have to copy this into a score that isn't a selector. So what we do is see the scoreboard players operation length round length equals at a type equals armor name equals game round length. Now you can see that whenever I update this round length, the length gets exactly the same score. Now, this is where the problem comes in. If I go to game mode zero, we can take a look at our sign over here. This sign is at coordinates five, two, one. That is what we're going to be working with. So if I do a block data, five, two, one, we can actually see what the contents of this is. And it's this massive mess of jumbled text and lots of backslashes and quotation marks. That's what we're going to be working with. So game mode creative again, and let's head back to our command blocks and get cracking. Now there are various tools that can help you with this as well, but we're going to go through it the hardcore manual way. The Minecraft JSONs page that I linked you to in the previous episode doesn't actually handle signs all that well, but there is a sign generator that they link to from that page that can do a little bit of a better job. But of course we know what we're doing, so let's do that manually. First of all, we're only going to be doing this whenever we update. So we're going to copy this execute command and place that first. And then what we're going to do is block data. Five, two, one was the coordinates. And now what we're updating is the third line of text, which is text three. And that is a string. Now what this contains is actually a raw JSON, but it's kind of encoded. So we want something here and then we can take the easy part first, which is the text. And what we really want to say is that the text is supposed to be space min. That would be really nice if you do that, but notice how this quotation mark is kind of inside this quotation mark now. We have to escape it. Uh, otherwise the parser here thinks that this is the whole string and then it fails. The way you do that is you put backslash before it and that's why there's backslashes all over that data. So now we have that, now we need to do the first part. We wanted to say the number of minutes and the number of minutes is stored in a scoreboard. So this is a score field and that has a sub clause of its own, which has an objective that is round the length. And it also has a name and that name is length. Now let's do game mode zero, head over here and see if this, whoa, and see if this works. And to do that, we do trigger action set one. And now you can see as the score updates in the scoreboard around the length sign here updates. So that's great, but we still can't click it. So let's go and take care of that too. Now what a clickable link actually is is another piece of data in this raw JSON. And you put it within one of these clauses, but it actually applies to the entire sign, which is a weird thing you might snag on. Anyway, this thing goes within a string, so we can take the first one, which says the number, and then we add on a click event. And that is 
another subclass and this in turn has an action and that action is going to be run command and it also has a value and that value is the command that we want to run so we're going to put that in here and then we're done that command is going to be slash trigger action set one you actually have to have this slash otherwise it will type it out in chat it really treats this as if the player had entered it which is a really kind of weird thing so now with that horrible command set we can go back to game mode zero go take a look at our sign here and let's see get me a good angle here do trigger action set one and now this sign should have a clickable link data so let's do scoreboard objectives set display sidebar sidebar to get rid of that and you see if i right click here we now cycle through around lengths. That was a lot of effort. What you also might want to do is change the font here or do an underline or something to indicate that this is a clickable sign as opposed to another normal sign. I leave that as an exercise for all you raw JSON lovers out there. Anyway, we have the round length in a scoreboard, which means that when we start our game, we can use that to set up the match properly. And that is the entire system set up in Minecraft 1.9. And as usually is the case, there's really not much of a difference between Minecraft 1.8 and 1.9 in this case. I'm going to update the map that is in the download, but all the commands are going to be exactly the same. So they'll just be copy pasted into the fail clock in 1.8. And that's all you need to do. So that was some complicated raw JSON stuff. And I hope it made some sort of sense even though it is really hard to convey the kind of nuances of that syntax in video. With that said, next time we're going to start looking at actually getting into our game. We've done a lot of lobby work here, and the last part of that is going to be state 1 here. We're going to take a look at how to implement the ready check from entrapment in your map. That'll be next time. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Slice Lime, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.